Hi guys! If you don't know me, my name is Luna, and I'll be going over the rules and components of a game called Dwarf Dig that I created. It is a four-player cooperative game, and it takes around an hour to play, so it's not too bad. Nice little family game that you can play on the side. First things first, we'll go over components, since that is also the first page uh, listed in the rules that should be included in the game. So within your game, you should have common resource hexagonal tiles and these will go by rock, wood, and iron. Uh, you should have seven each of these and then you should also have four each of the rare resources which include gold and diamond. Now, that's not the end of the hexagonal tiles, however, you do have six dirt hexagons and you'll have five water hexagons. I'll go over the explanations over all of this when we get to the rules portion. As far as room hexagons go, you will have one great hall, two kitchens, and five bedrooms, as well as a starting point, which I will pop up here. As well as all of these hexagonal tiles, you will also have four player pieces, because you need something to play as, four tokens, which come in the same colors, Four character boards, which once again come in the same colors. Uh, one turn marker, which will be a mixture of colors. And one earthquake marker. As far as resource cards go, you should have as many of these in the common resources and rare resources as there is the limit on a character board times four, since there are four players. This means that there should be 28 of each rock, wood, and iron resource, and there should be 16 of each gold and diamond. Every great game has a game board, and this is it. You should have five hexagonal tiles down and eight across. That's a total of 40, and if you've done all the math on all of the tiles, you will see that all of them, not including the rooms, add up to exactly 40. This is because you're going to want to reveal the entire game board as well as build all of your rooms to win the game. That's essentially the goal. Back to the game board, you have the turn counter here, which is where you're going to put your turn counter here at zero, and you have your earthquake counter over here, which you're also going to put at zero because you haven't had any yet you'll see that the turn counter goes all the way down to 8. However, on the 8th space, it does have an E for Earthquake, which means on this turn, for this person, an Earthquake happens. Once that happens, you will, of course, move the Earthquake counter down. After every player has finished their turn, they, of course, move the turn counter down. As far as the tiles up here, it will have the same pictograph as the starting point tile. That's because you get to choose your own starting point. Now for beginners, I do recommend starting here. Let's get our starting point tile and go ahead and put it on the beginner starting point. Now before I get too in depth with the game, I'd love to go over the character cards. Every person gets a character card with the same color they chose as their player piece and token. So essentially, each player gets a player piece, player card, and player token, all of the same color. You'll have purple, blue, red, and green. Now, character cards are so important because they have the ability of that player written in the middle of the card. They also have the same sized spaces for each of the resources that you collect. So for the common resources, they'll always be at the bottom. You see you have iron, rock, and wood, and each of those have a seven card limit. And then up at the top, you'll see you have a card limit of four for the rare resources of gold and diamond. Another great feature of the character card is at the top left. And that includes all the resources you need to build each room. And then in the top right, you also have a rundown of what you can do on your turn. You'll have the ordered list via numbers, and then the actions that you can pick from any of those without order uh, listed via letters. This is great so that you don't have to keep referring back to the rule book. 
Once everyone has sorted out which color they want, which character card and special ability that they'd like, you all put your player pieces here on the starting point that you've chosen. After you've shuffled all of the resource and dirt and water hexagons, you place them all off to the side. You also place all room hexagons off to the side except for the four bedroom hexagons. Each player gets a bedroom hexagon because each player has to individually build their own. And then as far as your resource cards go, they too go off to the side as a bank. It's shortest player first, seeing as how you're all playing as dwarves. And after that, turns go in a clockwise fashion. You'll see that the hexagonal tiles are double-sided. You have a rubble side, or face down, and then you have the face up revealed side that has your resources. As far as turns go, you have the earthquake when applicable is first and that is on the turn at the very end however we will go over all of that later and you're obviously not going to start out with that so when you get to the second part of your turn you can trade however that can only be if your players end up on the same space which means same hexagonal tile and then as far as the third turn goes, it's broken down into a set of actions that you can take. And you can choose three of these, and we'll go over those in more depth. You have, uh, you can move, you can mine, you can rotate, remove, rebel, build, or resurrect. We'll, we'll go over each of these individually. However, um, we'll go ahead and go down to four, and what four states is that when a player ends their turn, they can then move the turn marker as suggested. Um, if it is the person who has been on the earthquake, they, after all of that has gone, they go straight back up to the zero, and then they move the earthquake token down one, having experienced their first earthquake. Now, players move one space at a time as far as movement goes within the action section of the character board. When a player moves, they reveal undiscovered territory because they're moving into a territory that is, voila, undiscovered. Now, revealing a hexagon within undiscovered territory does not take up an action. It is an automatic function of the game. So if a blue player decides to move all three turns and let's say they got three stone, then that means that the next player can then move two across revealed hexagons. If they're moving into uncharted, undiscovered territory, they can only move one. However, as far as an action goes, if they're just doing one action, they can move two. This makes expansion and discovery of the board a lot quicker, and if a dwarf dies, it makes running back to the starting point to then resurrect one all the more easier. We'll go over that momentarily. Now, let's say you're player two and you're feeling a little bit more adventurous. You don't want to just move and reveal hexagons on the board. You still want to remove a few times, so we'll say that you move here and voila, wow, you have come across a rare resource, so you want to go ahead and mine this before you move any further. Now, as far as mining goes, first things first, you roll a d6 to decide how many of this resource you get. So, we'll roll the d6, let's say you get a 4, and that means, that's actually a really lucky roll, you would get four of the diamond resource. So whoever's playing banker gets four of the diamond resources and hands it to the purple player. Once the player has mined, they place their token down. Now, once a player has placed their token down on a mined resource, that means if they move here and then want to mine this resource, which is rock, they cannot because the rule is is that wherever that colored player's token is 
they cannot mine around any of the hexagonal tiles uh, adjacent to it. So let's say if this was way down here and you had revealed resources all around, you couldn't mine any of these six hexagonal tiles because they're surrounding this one. They're adjacent. If the next player comes in and wants to mine the rare resource as well, they cannot. This resource is essentially blocked until the second player decides that they want to mine another resource. Once they've mined another resource, they can take their token, they place it on the newest resource that they've mined, and then that resource card, that resource hexagon, is available to mine uh, from any other player. So let's keep on going with our turns to show you how this happens in action. Now the second player has decided to move, which is an action, and then mine, which is another action. They can then decide to move to one of these revealed hexagons, to move next to the red player and trade with them on their next turn, or they can move to an unrevealed hexagon, which that's what we'll say he will do. Then they will end their turn, and we'll say it's blue player's turn next. So, they cannot move to this space and mine the diamond resource. However, they can move twice across a revealed space, and they can mine this one. So we'll do that, and he got a one, so he would get one. Now, as far as the rolls go, if you get one through four, that's the amount of cards you get. If you get one, you get one resource card, all the way up to four. If you roll a five or a six, which I just rolled a six, you get nothing. However, even if you come up nothing, you have still technically mined that resource. Your token goes down and no one else can mine from said resource. Now let's say we go all along the turns and they just want to traverse the board for a while. Well, let's say we get back to player purple. Now, like I said, they can't mine any of these surrounding tiles. However, as I was saying, if they want to move out of the range of where their color token is, and they can move twice across revealed hexagons. So we're going to move to another rare revealed resource, which is this diamond here. We're going to mine it, which is our second action. So we'll roll the dice. They get two. And then you may take the token off of this hexagon and place it on the newly mined one. Let's then say that the next player who's blue, wants to mine this resource, however they can't, because their token is blocking the area of which they can mine from. So, once you get to green, they could be able to run across the space and mine this resource, if they wanted to. Now, the rotation action is a pretty easy action to go over. Basically, the player which tile that they are currently on, they can rotate it however they'd like. Now, I can't explain this mechanic without not also explaining the reason for the lines on each hexagon. As you'll see, each resource hexagon has three lines. They'll have two black lines and one blue line. The two black lines are earthquake lines, and the blue line is your water line. As far as the black lines go, they are where your earthquake is going to travel. So the reason why you might want to rotate a hexagon is to block or shift uh, the way that an earthquake travels if you've counted ahead and you've strategized when the earthquake will happen and who will be landing on which hexagon that uh, the earthquake will start from. 
Now, as far as the water lines go, you want to have those connected via the water hexagonal tiles. Now, this needs to be connected to the kitchen room that you'll be building. If the water line is not connected to the kitchen, it's not activated as a room, and it does not count as a win, even if you've built all rooms. That is a necessary feature to the game, and you cannot win without it. Also, as far as the kitchen goes, you cannot just skip the water line process and decide to build the kitchen hexagon around adjacent to the water hexagon without any water lines connecting. Which then brings us to the building action in and of itself. If a player wants to build a room and has enough resources to do so, there are constraints. When building a room, you cannot have an unsteady resource beneath it. So let's say the dirt resource cannot be beneath a hexagon on which you'd like to build a room on. So let's say you'd like to build a room on this one up here. Well, of course you can't because there is a dirt hexagon directly beneath it. As far as which ones constitute unstable hexagons, well, that includes the dirt hexagon, which we have pulled, the water hexagon, which is the one over here, as well as rubble. Now, rubble happens when earthquakes happen. You also cannot build anything on a rubble hexagon. As you can see, the hexagons that are undiscovered are all rubble. So if you decided to build a room on this resource card, you could not because there is a rubble hexagon directly beneath it. In closing with the building action, as far as rooms, the Great Hall is one of the special rooms where dwarves will have to pull their resources. If you want to build the Great Hall, you have to have 10 of every common resource and 10 of every rare resource. Of course, one dwarf in and of themselves cannot build this because they don't have enough due to the card limit. Now, if someone wants to build the Great Hall, you guys have all the resources put together. There would have to be three dwarves due to the card limit constraints on your character cards. Since you can only have a four card limit of the rare cards and you have to have ten of the rare resource cards, you of course would have to pull them together as three dwarves. And this is the only way you can build the Great Hall and it is the only room that doesn't have a replacement. So if the Great Hall falls, the game is over because you don't have another great hall to build. As you'll see in your buildings, you do have two kitchens and five bedrooms. So you can have an earthquake destroy at least one kitchen or one bedroom, but that's not the case for the great hall. If the great hall falls, you all fall. But if you do end up pulling together your resources and building a room, you would then take the room from the sidelines pick up your dwarf player pieces, place said room, and place them back on said room. Now, removing rubble is an action that can really only be described after we've explained the earthquake mechanic. However, for the sake of quickly going over the action, if there's an earthquake and you end up with rubble, which is a flipped over resource card, you can remove the rubble if you have moved to the space where the rubble is and then use the action remove rubble to then flip the resource hexagon back over. Of course, purple player's special action is removing rubble from anywhere on the board. So purple could be as far away as over here and the rubble could be all the way over here and he could still come over here, use one of his actions, and flip it over. The resurrection action can only occur if a dwarf dies. If this happens, this has of course happened during an earthquake. And if you are so unlucky as to be a dwarf who has died, 
you take your player piece away from the board and you hold on to it until one of your fellow dwarves can then rescue you. So let's say red's pretty close to the starting point. They use a move to move back up to the starting point and then they use another action to then resurrect you. What would happen then is that blue would then take their player piece back to the starting point and they could both move on from there. Blue doesn't get their turn until it comes back around to them. Now as far as blue dying, we'll go ahead and go over what happens. If a character dies, they have to take one of each resource that they've collected and put it back in the bank as punishment. Now let's explain how earthquakes work by going through a pretty bad scenario. Let's say purple player is the last player to have ended their turn, and so they move the turn token from 7 to earthquake, which is the 8th circle here. That means that if the next person's turn is blue, or really even any of these characters, the earthquake originates from the closest dark hexagon. Now you're probably wondering, well, green is kind of equally spaced between these two. Well, if that does occur, the earthquake happens from the lowest point on the board. So, even if these are tied for the same distance from the green, it would still be this one because it's lowest on the board. If it's still tied after that, like if you had a dirt tile here and a dirt tile here, the player can then choose which earthquake, uh, which dirt hexagon the earthquake originates from. Now, what I mean to say from originating, it means that this dirt hexagon is basically the center point of the earthquake. It happens here. And this is where those earthquake lines I was talking about earlier come into play. For every hexagon around it, you will have to follow every black line that stems from this. So since this black line is coming through as an earthquake, blue dies. This also means that the black line that this red character is in also comes through the hexagon that they're currently in, so they also die. They perish, they'll have to give one of each resource card that they have collected back to the bank, and you'll have to keep following the earthquake. It's not even over yet, and two players are already dead. Now, like I said, undiscovered territory does indeed count as rebel and this affects it in a different way. If they're next to each other or even if the black line leads to a rebel space, it affects it in different ways. Now if it leads to rebel like it is now, then every single tile in that direction turns to rebel, which means this gets turned over which also means green thankfully narrowly avoided death. And of course, that's not all folks. You have an earthquake line stemming from here to another dirt hexagon, which also means the hexagons around this are then affected. So this resource hexagon is turned to rubble as well, because if you look at your rules, when an earthquake hits a dirt hexagon, it turns the above and below into rubble. And that's only the two directly above and below. It's not quite as drastic as hitting a rubble here and the whole line becoming rubble. So if we start here and we go through here, it hits all the way to this hexagon. However, let's say purple on his last turn came to his senses that the earthquake was coming and for an action had turned this hexagon. If this player had not turned this hexagon and the black line connected, purple would also have died and the game would have ended because three dwarves would have been dead at once. A big tip for the game is try and look ahead and see when an earthquake is going to happen and look through all the different lines and see where it's going to affect and how to make sure the damage isn't so drastic. I'm going to take these tokens off just for the example, but let's say the earthquake line, starting from here, 
went all the way up to this water hexagon. The way it affects the water hexagon is similar to the dirt hexagon, but also more drastic than that. As far as the water hexagon goes, it turns the two on the sides, the left and right, and turns them into rubble. So these two would be turned into rubble. And if there were two resource hexagons here, they would also then be turned into rubble as well. However, the bottom and below is unaffected. So it's basically um, the exact opposite of the dirt hexagon. The dirt hexagon affects the one directly above and below, and the water hexagon affects the ones from the left to the right. And then you have your rubble hexagons that affects everything in the direction back from it. So it's also hitting this, but there were no resource hexagons affected due to the fact that there wasn't any hexagon right here. Now, for an example, if the game had been even farther along, and let's say the players came together and built a kitchen, and put it here, since there's a stable hexagon below it, if the earthquake lines were to run directly to the room, the room would be discarded and cannot be used again. And you would only then have one more kitchen left to use for a room. Now, if the Great Hall had been there and the earthquake line had gone through to a room, the room would have been destroyed, discarded, and the game would have ended, seeing as how you only have one Great Hall to use. Now, as an overview of how to die and how to win, and how the game ends, Players die if a player is on a space that turns to rubble, so even if the line didn't lead through in my earthquake example, if a player had been um, in an area that had turned to rubble, so if a player had been here, the earthquake had led to this dirt hexagon, and then of course it affects the one directly above and below, the player would have died. And then of course the player dies if the earthquake leads through the hexagon tile they're currently within. And again, to reiterate it, if a player dies, they do have to give up one of each resource to the bank. Now, the game actually ends if there aren't enough rooms to finish due to the discards, which I explained earlier, um, since you have a limited amount. Um, if you reach the fifth earthquake, which is the final earthquake turn here, which is kind of the do-all, end-all of the game, then the game ends if you have not uh, filled all of the requirements. And it also ends if three dwarves are dead at the same time, which we also went over. So once again, the players win once all of the tiles on the board have been revealed, and the players have built all of the rooms. So you would have had to have built four bedrooms, one kitchen that's connected to a water tile, and one great hall. So once you've fulfilled all of those requirements, you guys win. All right, so that is all for the rules, gameplay, and components of the game Dwarf Dig. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you enjoyed the game, please tell me. If you did not, if you have any suggestions on how to tweak it and make the game significantly better, um, feel free to comment. Other than that, once again, thank you guys so much for watching. Have a great day and have fun playing board games. Bye.